started out as a very dark night in February. It was in the desert. The sky was very black and the landscape was very still, except that the sky was studded with thousands of stars. It was very quiet, so I thought. Then I heard a rustling in the brush and I, I turned on my flashlight and I saw the tail of a kangaroo rat scurrying through the sand. And then it was quiet again, so I thought. Then I heard giggling, nervous adolescent giggling. So I walked back to camp and I saw the sprawl of middle school students splayed out on the ground, huddled in their sleeping bags. Some of them had their favorite pillows they brought from home. And I heard this muffled voice say, I heard a wolf. <laughs> I said, there are no wolves in this desert, but let's just be quiet and listen. And so I heard very faintly eke out into the darkness a howl. And it was joined by another howl, another howl. And then there was a, this symphony of synchronized howling and yipping and yapping. And I said, those are coyotes. And I looked around at the kids, and they were sitting bolt upright in their bags. <laughs> and they were as still as the night. That's how I got my start in outdoor education, but I'm getting ahead of the story, so I have to start about, get back to my original origins. So I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area in a very sort of relatively mundane middle, middle class family in the East Bay. My parents didn't fish, they didn't hunt, they didn't hike, they sure didn't backpack, and I grew up in a neighborhood where I had no neighbors who were park rangers or biologists or natural resource professionals. But the one thing that my parents did do is they were married in a little chapel in Yosemite back in 1946. And so I think that, well, for one thing, I know they probably didn't see anybody that looked like them in Yosemite in 1946, you know, outside of their little entourage. But I think that my mother told my father, after all the ceremony and everything. She said, Jim, my father's name, Jim, if we come back here one day, let's bring our kids. And so that's what they did. So I grew up, like a lot of kids, very curious. Every rock I had to turn over to see what lurked underneath it. And so by the time I was three, my mother was trained, when she did the laundry, to empty my pockets <laughs> and take the snails out. Uh, so a few years later, I was in the grocery store with her, and there was a time when you could actually order encyclopedias from the grocery store. Most people here aren't old enough to remember that, <laughs> but there was the first volume of an encyclopedia, and it was called the Illustrated Encyclopedia of Animal Life. Persuasive kid that I was, I talked my mother into subscribing to it, so every two weeks, this volume would come to my house and I couldn't wait for it to come. I read them all the time. I even took them in the bathroom. <laughs> Those books took me on a journey around the world. I learned about the Black Panther in Sri Lanka. I learned about lemurs in Madagascar. And, you know, I had no idea how I could ever visit those places or, and I certainly had no idea how people could make a living studying wildlife. But it fed my interest. It, it helped me to, to think bigger, even though I didn't know anybody that did that sort of work. And so that, that call of the coyote that I mentioned was still kind of far off in the distance. My father was an avid golfer, and he tried to introduce me to golf. So he would take me to the golf course, and by the second hole, I would politely excuse myself, or I would just disappear. <laughs> I'd go to the clubhouse, and get a paper cup, and I would head down to the little ditch, I can't call it a creek, a little ditch around the golf course, and I would collect mosquito larvae. And I would very carefully bring them home in the car so that they wouldn't spill. And when I got home, I would put the cup on my windowsill. And, and I would watch the larvae, and you know, after they stop wiggling, you know, what do they do next? They turn into the pupa and the pupa would float on top of the water. And then I would open my window, and I would watch the adults emerge and 
stretch their wings, and, and fly out the window. My parents never knew. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they never complained about bites. So I, you know, I, I figured that, that it was OK. Um, so fast forward just a very few years to, to junior high school. So junior high and high school, I was cool, right? <laughs> So I cared about my clothes, I cared about girls, I cared about making it to all the parties I was invited to. But in our country, it was a time of revolution. There was a women's movement, there was a black power movement, there was gay rights movement, we had People's Park, we had students shot dead at Kent State campus, we had Stonewall. There was the largest manhunt in history for a woman, Angela Davis. And so all these things were happening. And so snails and mosquitoes were the last thing that I was thinking about. There were a lot of other things going on in the world. So I didn't realize until I got to my junior year in college that I could actually study things in college that I read about back when I was 9 or 10 years old with that set of encyclopedias. And so I realized, too, that it was a lot harder in college because I studying population dynamics and predator-prey relationships, learning how birds migrate and how bees could tell each other where pollen is. And then they had to bring math into it. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> you know, calculus? Really? <laughs> I, I got through geometry in high school. Um, and, and still, I didn't know what I would do with this. I was just taking classes that I liked. And so the howl of the coyote, that howl was still somewhere in the distance. I didn't know how I related to that. In my first job out of college, my girlfriend was offered two jobs. And I took the one that she rejected. <laughs> and, and, and the job was to be a counselor for kids in Los Angeles and to take them into wild places. So I had no experience backpacking, unless you call hitching around Hawaii on the big island Backpacking. I did have a pack on, uh, but, but it was the cheapest pack I could find, and, and the shoulder strap, strap broke before I got out of the city. So I didn't have a lot of experience, but I had worked with uh, boys in a boys' group home, and they were difficult, challenging boys. And, and they thought, well, you know, that's sort of a transferable skill for this job. So I worked with kids from L.A. and East L.A., and, you know, some had challenging backgrounds. A lot of kids were poor. A lot of kids hadn't really left their, their neighborhoods. So uh, we took them all over the place. We went to the High Sierras. Uh, we, went to the or we went to the coast. Um, and the, but the thing that we did that was special is when we, would, when we would get somewhere, we made sure that there were professionals that came and talked to the kids. So they learned about what park rangers did. They built trail. They had the obligatory scary stories around the campfire. Uh, and when they got six, to be 16, they actually applied for it and were hired for seasonal jobs in state parks and the U.S. Forest Service. So they got an exposure to careers. And yes, they did hear the howl of the coyote. My career moved on. I worked with Conservation Corps programs. I went to graduate school, got a master's degree in environmental education. But by then, I, my interest started to expand. I became interested in environmental planning and restoration, natural resource management. So I worked for the Nature Conservancy. I worked for the US Forest Service. Uh, I worked right here, uh, Metro Regional Parks and Green Spaces. And m most recently, uh, Sylvia Hayes mentioned, um, I guess, AKA the governor appointed me as a commissioner to the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. So, but my day job was starting to get a little distant from my conservation work. I started doing community affairs and, and small business development, and I thought that was, that was good stuff, but then I started kind of missing um, the work that I used to do bringing people outdoors. And I have a minute. <laughs> and so, um, I thought, well, what can I do? Well, what can I do myself? to help to bring more people into wild places that don't have that experience and that background. So I talked to a friend of mine, her name is Trisha, uh, Trisha Tillman, and I said, Trisha, why don't we just start an organization? And why don't we partner, why don't we coordinate with other groups? Uh, why don't we uh, 
develop this plan and, and, and why don't, you know, let, let's just start a coalition. So she said, okay, yeah, you go ahead and do that. So I started, <laughs> so I started talking to these groups and I found out that they were busy, you know, running their own organizations. And, and, they all, and some were skeptical. They said, well, you know, you're not, you're not going to get black folks to go out in the woods. You know? So I felt discouraged. And I said, well, well Tricia, you know, what, what do you think we should do? And she said, you know what? All we have to do is just develop a calendar with some dates on it, have a meeting place, and whoever shows up, let's just take them out. And that's what we did. And that's how the African American Outdoor Association started in 2005. So we developed a, mis a mission statement. Uh, because uh, she has a master's in public health, my background is environmental education, and so our mission is to develop a community-based solution to address the health disparity issues in African Americans by engaging them in vigorous physical activity that brings them into the outdoors. And of course, uh, our outings and our activities are open to everybody. So I'll just close with, with our first camping trip, and it was on the Deschutes River, and it was sort of a family camp. It was, it was good for first-time campers. It was sort of noisy, and um, you could hear the river rushing by. But by about 2 a.m., it was quiet, and I just laid back in my bag, and, and I thought back over, over years of my life and my career, and I closed my eyes, and I could just about still hear that, that first coyote howl.